Well, welcome everyone to today's uh, ABB seminar. I've never met. I'm Drew Higgins. I'm, uh, I'm here in the Queen's Bank Research Department, and I've got the pleasure of introducing today's CIMR seminar speaker, McMaster's very own uh, Jillian Bowers. Um, her group applies solid state NMR to understand various processes occurring in electric and polarity conversion of storage technology, so for example, lithium ion batteries. And uh, she is a professor and chair of a well deserved community. I could recite all of Professor Gower's accolades, but she's very humble and I don't want to disturb my or get her to listen to that. But maybe I can, I can give a personal anecdote. Circa 2012, I had the pleasure of seeing Professor Gower give a talk um, as part of a CARPA SE, a fuel cell and a lithium ion battery network. And first of all, I was blown away by the excellent research that her team does. And second of all, her ability to communicate research on the topic of lithium ion batteries that I knew very little about and NMR that I knew very, absolutely nothing about. But she made everything accessible in a very nice way. And I still remember that talk very fondly from about a decade ago. You know, fast forward, everywhere I go, when I say, oh, McMaster University, I get so many, oh, you must know Jillian Gabbard. <laughs> she does great work. She does great work. I was in Estonia of all places a month ago, touring their NMR facilities. And they said, oh, we collaborate with Professor Gower, Technic Master. And I said, oh, I know her. You know. So making an impact in the McMaster family. And honestly, the type of person that the scientific community needs more of. So uh, without babbling on any more, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Gower. <laughs> Thanks very much, Drew. Am I on? Do I need to do something? Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay. Good. Um, so I hope I live up to my 2012 self. That's a little daunting. <laughs> and let me just say thank you for joining me this afternoon. Um, when Alex first asked me to do this, the scheduled date was March. And I said, as March came around, look how many things are going on. We're interviewing candidates. We've got all these other seminars. You don't need to hear from me. And so we rescheduled for now, and now we've got four seminars within 25 hours, I think, in the department. So we're just always doing a lot of things. So thank you for taking time to come today. And I hope you were at Cheyenne seminar and or are going to Richie's as well. Um, so I'm going to tell you about what our group work on in the area of magnetic resonance and lithium ion batteries. But before I do that, I think it's to say we motivate our work with ideas around how do we get away we as a society think about alternative energy materials and we're going to think about them in gory detail today because that's what chemists do but at the big picture level we want to talk about climate change and talk about mitigation strategies in our daily lives so that it's clear that we as scientists want change to happen and so i think that's a really important thing for my research team for us as scientists to be to be talking in that framework Lithium batteries are uh, near and dear to my heart, going way back to when I was a graduate student. And actually, I'll go a step further back based on who's in the audience. So, here, as a student in 1993, and Dr. Greeden is here, and he taught a solid state chemistry course in my fourth year, which was inspirational. And he introduced me to Linda Nazar, who was my PhD advisor. So, there are lots of connections that make this kind of talk different to give than your usual conference talk. And hopefully you'll see that as we go along as well. Um, my point is not. I didn't seem to feel that. Okay. Hello. Oh. There we go. Is this working now? Yes, okay. Okay, so what we're gonna do is talk about three select battery problems and how magnetic resonance strategies can help us to mitigate those. The first, we all live in Canada. If you've looked at all at electric vehicles, you might know that the range you get on the sticker at the sales dealership is twice the range that you'll get in the winter. And why is this? This is because electrolytes don't behave well in cold temperatures. 
Another thing you'll notice at the dealership is that it costs you a little bit more to buy an electric vehicle. That's because the battery is more than half the cost in most electric vehicles nowadays. We want to think about how we can improve that cost factor. A lot of that will come by scaling up. So that's actually not necessarily a materials problem, but we still do think about alternative materials that might help. And finally, lithium batteries make the news for all the wrong reasons. I get called by news agencies as soon as one of these news stories breaks. Are you going to tell us that we should not buy lithium vehicles? I'm like, no, <laughs> calm down. Um, but what's going on here is specifically related to how we charge the material and a process called lithium plating. And it turns out that magnetic resonance is a good way to detect whether that is happening in your cell. So we're going to look at how to measure electrolyte dynamics as a function of temperature, how to characterize alternative materials, and how to detect the lithium plating process. Lithium battery chemistry 101. This is my favorite schematic of a lithium ion battery. Pink are the lithium ions. They occur in environments in this structure. So when you talk about lithium ion batteries, there's lots more chemistry, many more elements of the periodic table involved than just lithium. Um, the lithium in the center here is solvated by organic electrolyte. In the anode, it's intercalated within graphite. And in the right, in the cathode, it's intercalated within a transition metal oxide that changes its redox oxidation state as we charge and discharge the cell. If you know anything about NMR and the things I've just described about these materials, you might be worried that we're gonna try and do NMR of these materials. They're paramagnetic, there are multiple phases, there are lithium ions in a variety of environments. We're gonna have a lot of broad lines, we're gonna have a lot of problems trying to do NMR here. But in fact, our group and others have realized that this is actually a treasure trove of opportunities for looking at these different local environments and being very quantitative specific about what's changing in the structure. So first, let's start with the liquid electrolytes. And the reason I chose to start here for this talk is if you've done organic chemistry, you've taken an MR spectrum of a well-behaved organic solution. And that's the closest thing that we have in our lithium chemistry to what you might have done in the, in the lab in the NMR. So these organic solutions of electrolyte, they're a big reason that your cells are flammable. If we measure the NMR spectrum of the lithium in the electrolyte, we get one peak, it's pretty boring. What else are we gonna do? We're gonna measure a pulse field gradient experiment that lets us characterize the diffusion properties of the lithium ion. And so all the work that you do to shim and homogeneously uh, have a homogeneous field around your sample, we go in and we ruin that with a gradient pulse and that gives us spatial resolution of where the lithium is in the sample. And that's important because then we can track whether it moved or not. So if you look at this equation here, all of these parameters are under our control, except for the diffusion coefficient measure and the signal as it dies away as a function of the gradient. So this gives us beautiful data. These are, these are just gorgeous spectra to collect. Immediately get a quantitative picture of the lithium ion mobility, both the lithium and actually the fluorine centers as well. We're going to do a bit of messiness with our nicely behaved NMR liquid sample. Uh, this is what I call MacGyver School of Engineering. So this was our early days of figuring out how to do these experiments because we don't want to measure lithium dynamics just of an organic solution with nothing going on. We want to measure under potential. To do that, we crammed a little bit of lithium metal at the bottom of our sample. Otherwise, this is a glass and a MR tube like we used. We have our electrolyte solution and we have a second plug of lithium metal and those are both contacted. And we then measure a one dimensional profile of that lithium concentration, which is one molar when we start the experiment. Then we apply a potential and we generate a concentration gradient. Oops, I didn't let you see the animation. There you go, zoom. And what's happening here is the lithium at the top is plating out as a metal. It's now a solid, so it's invisible to the NMR experiment. So we are able to detect this concentration gradient and extract diffusion par parameters, transference numbers, et cetera, in a very quantitative way. So here's an example. We're now working in a non-MacGyver <laughs> sample holder. This is a machined peak sample holder that gives us better control of the electrolytes and the electrodes. And we can generate a 60% concentration gradient left to right across a two millimeter volume of liquid electrolyte 
with a C over 10 current. So in electrochemistry speak, C over 10 means charging in 10 hours. That's quite slowly, very gentle. And nevertheless, 60% concentration gradient. And at each point across this concentration gradient, I can also measure the diffusion coefficient. And what you see is the higher the concentration, the slower the ion dynamics. So this is one of the effects when we try and charge quickly, we generate these concentration gradients in the cell. So here's this cell. This is time equals zero in red, going up to 90, the concentration gradient that reaches steady state. That simplifies our math because now the terms on the right equal the terms on the left and we can cancel things out and solve very accurately for the concentration for the diffusion properties. We do this as a function of temperature. We can also vary, of course, the composition of the electrolyte. And this is Dave Bazak, who you may re remember. He graduated a couple of years. This is one of his labor of love data sets. So this is at several different temperatures, several different current densities, and you can see the steep concentration gradient that's evolving as we apply more and more current to the cell. And he's gone through and analyzed this exquisitely, knowing exactly where his field of view is and what the concentration is. And the main takeaway message is we generate really strong concentration gradients when we're at low current, at low temperature and at high current. Okay, that's about liquid electrolytes and it's a tool, it's useful, but now I want to move into talking about solids. BIMR somehow solid state materials, so I want to focus our talk here in the solid state. We're going to look first at some cathode materials and the cathode materials are paramagnetic. So this spells bad news for NMR, but the way that we get around this is by magic angle spinning. And I'll show you here, this is the magic angle. It's 54.7 degrees. You can remember it very easily. It's the body diagonal of a cube. And when we spin at that angle, you get the same effect as molecular tumbling in solution. And therefore we get much narrower lines than if we do a static experiment. Okay, so what we're gonna do is collect this cathode material, scrape it out of the battery and put it in the magnet at different states of charge and discharge. But before I get there, let me tell you a bit more about the material itself. This is an iron battery. We've got both iron centers and vanadium centers. They're both paramagnetic. This is the charge and discharge profile. And what we're gonna do is stop at multiple points along the charge and discharge profile. Tiana is the student who has done this experiment. She's on maternity leave right now, actually, uh, but I just want to give her a shout out. She's done some really elegant work here, not only with my group, but with Bordeaux and with Jim Britton in the x-ray facility in order to understand this structure properly. So here's just a picture of what our typical rotors look like. This is before I was born, this is when I was 20, this is when I was 30, this is when I was 40, no, but pretty much. So the faster we can spin, the better the resolution we get. And so when I was a grad student, four millimeter rotors were state of the art. And now we have 1.3 millimeter, that's the best we have at McMaster. They actually have 0 0.9 millimeter rotors. They can spin above hundred kilohertz. So imagine packing those in the glove box and be sympathetic to my students. Okay. So the lithium spectroscopy looks great, but here's the first puzzle. The crystal structure says three sites. We clearly see six. What's going on? So we went back to our collaborators. This material came from University of Montreal. We said, could you make us another sample? We're not quite sure what's going on here. They tried a few times. We kept getting this split population. Two groups of three peaks is what I thought was going on. We went back to their paper and realized, oh, two different types of samples. There's a really key difference here. This, where they did their single crystal diffraction, is from a melt at 850 degrees Celsius. And this, that they're doing their electrochemistry on and that they sent us, was treated at 580. Make single crystals for anybody's cathode materials in their batteries. Okay, so Jim Britton has been very valuable here. The powder diffraction of the two phases looks identical, but he went meticulously with Tiana, pulled out a single crystal, and they were able to determine that two of the six vanadium sites split into either the original vanadium position or the A position. And they do it together. So the two and the six go together. 
And to resolve the crystal structure accurately, they needed to populate 15% of the vanadium sites in that new location. And then they could get beautiful diffraction data sets. This work has actually just been accepted for publication in chemistry of materials. And it's a lot due to Jim's very careful work to get this structure sorted. And then we wanted to take that data back to the NMR and say, now we've got two possible configurations. Looks a lot like my hypothesis of two different versions of three peaks. But I have excellent students in my group that's good enough and happen to have just started a collaboration with uh, collaborators in Bordeaux. So they said, let's try and do the calculation. We can do solid state chemistry calculations using DFT theory in a package called VASP, which is Vienna ab initio simulation package, I think. There's another version called CASTEP. People use different versions of these codes. Oleg is gonna ask me hard questions and I'll not know the answers, but that's okay. Um, so what we did was calculations of each of these structures. These are large unit cells. So if you've done any DFT, this is a lot of atoms to deal with. And we calculated the original structure, the straight up substitution of all the vanadiums to the new position, and then a mixture where we put 1 16th of the vanadium into that new location and kept the rest in their original positions. We had to treat something called the Hubbard interaction, which is a measure of how delocalized the electrons are in the structure. And the reason is that what we're trying to get at electron density at the transition metal, that unpaired electron density, how much of that can be shared to the lithium center? Because that's what causes the huge chemical effects. So happily, we were able to do this. Here's our experimental chemical shifts. Just focus on the top three for now. Here are the series of calculations increasing the value of that Hubbard parameter. And this was the best that we got. So at a 5.3 value of the U, we could get chemical shifts that are in the same order of magnitude ballpark. The trends are the same, the exact values are not. They tell me that's because VASP overestimates the positive shift contribution, there's no negative electron density in this case. Um, so that, that's quite satisfying. Then we go to the second structure. So now all of the vanadium in the peak configuration, and we get another set quite similar. So this my two versions of three sites, right? So far, so good. But Tiana, my very tenacious student was like, Jillian, you haven't figured out what this is yet. We need to know what this really high chemical shift. It's at 292 and it shows up in every sample all the time. We can't just ignore it. Okay. So this is where the mixed phase calculation became important. So we did a calculation now including a fraction in the pink sites and the rest in the orange sites able to generate a chemical shift that matches that unique position. So this is a new version of the lithium two site from the parent structure now called lithium five, which from the calculations is above 300 ppm and in our, in our experimental work, 300 ppm, around 300 ppm. So what does that mean? That means if we go in and look at the structure and map out where electron density, what we see are that there are three irons contributing unpaired electron density into lithium five, whereas every other lithium site is only two. And it's, this interaction scales with R cubed. So it's a very sensitive parameter to the local distance. So we're quite convinced that this is the reason that we see this one additional shift. And Tiana finally could say, okay, good, we can go ahead and publish. <laughs> um, it's been a big project. And the latest step is now to go into looking at the dynamics. When we look at ion dynamics, we make lithium batteries in a coin cell configuration. This is Tiana and the student Olivia. This is Chris and another summer student looking into the glove box. So we assemble the cells in the glove box because we're working with lithium metal. And then we pause at each point along that electrochemical curve that I showed you to ask the question, did those lithium environments change relative to that parent material? And so here's the series of spectra. This is a whole lot of months of work in one slide um, where we've paused at each of these points along the curve and then measured magic angle spinning packed in those tiny rotors in order to say, yes, absolutely, those lithium chemical shifts change massively, actually, as we insert extra lithium into the structure. And even more interesting than that, it goes from this two sets of three peaks through what looks to be a phase change. 
And so our hypothesis is that right at this new slope in the electrochemical curve, that there's a phase change happening. And we should be able to correlate that back to what we observe in the NMR spectra. And moreover, after this phase change, we now have a new set of only three peaks, and they're quite narrow, which does the ion dynamics. And in order to probe ion dynamics, we use ECSI. So this is the same as NOSI, NOSI spectroscopy, exactly the same experiment. And what we're looking at is the diagonal intensity, which is our original three peaks. And the question is, are there any off diagonal peaks? In the parent structure, the answer is no. But in the lithiated structure, now we have, these ions are now exchanging more rapidly than they did in the parent structure. It might surprise you because we're shoving in more lithium into a structure that's already quite full, but there's a phase change going on as well. And so at ion dynamics using um, not just the XE experiment, but also a selective inversion experiment. This, if you look carefully, what we've done is to flip the C peak and watch it come back to equilibrium. And at the same time, in observe the intensity at A and B. And if there's chemical exchange between those peaks, you get what's called a transient well, which is loss of signal intensity from A because it went over to C. As and this is a very nice quantitative experiment. Alec Bain, a colleague of ours from a few years ago, uh, wrote the software package that allows us to fit all of this. We can go through as a function of temperature and as a the degree of lithiation to map out the depth of that transient well with temperature and extract from that the activation energy for the site-specific lithium ion exchange in this new phase. And this is where my crystallography friends go, wait, you didn't assign those peaks yet. So we're still working on the assignment of those peaks because we, all we know is they are new. They didn't exist in the original phase. We can track them, they have beautiful dynamics. This is all beautiful NMR, but the exact assignment of them is still a question. The activation energies are shown here for each of those pairs of exchange. Well, as the middle, I'll note that the error bars in the middle are large. That's because there's spectral overlap between the middle site and the two outer ones. So it gives us a little bit of grief. But the interesting thing to observe is that we are shoving extra lithium in. At first, it created a new phase and a new dynamic process. And then as we continue to lithiate that new phase, the activation energy goes up. So it's becoming crowded again, the lithium ion dynamics slowing down slightly. Tiana also had the opportunity to go to the CLS. So this is where we can go back to the diffraction question and the structure. And we've got a beautiful series of diffraction as a function of lithiation of this structure. We can see the unit cell parameters changing. We haven't done the work of the REIT field refinement. And once we do that, then we'll be able to go back to our vast calculations and assign those three new lithium sites. But this has been a really, really exciting project for Tiana. She's gotten to do a wide variety of different types of experiment, and it's really come together beautifully. Um, this is also a nice place to transition. So in situ synchrotron methodology, quite well established. Any synchrotron source you go to, they'll have a beam line set up for doing lithium, um, put the beam through the coin cell and measure your diffraction experiments. Doing it to NMR, left weld find, but that's what we're gonna go back to now. So I've told you a whole detailed story about a cathode material. Now we're gonna flip over to the anode side where the in the anode commercialization of lithium batteries has been graphite for years and years. Since the first commercialization by Sony in 91, graphite is the thing to beat. It absorbs one lithium per six carbon atoms, and that's a very large gravimetric capacity, volumetric capacity, so I'll talk about silicon just at the very end. But the most important thing when we lithiate graphite is that we're propping open the graphite layers and putting lithium in layer by layer, and these are well and we can track them by NMR. And we can also track the process of the lithium ion having to desolvate, lose that organic molecule shell and insert into the graphite. And it turns out that that is very rate limiting. So when you try and charge quickly and it doesn't work, <laughs> it's because you're getting a traffic jam of lithium ions at that interface. They're not desolvating well, they're not able to insert properly and you generate a lithium plating phenomena. Okay, let me just say one more thing. We're gonna to focus today on spectroscopy in all of these in-situ measurements. Goals in our group are to get to 
relaxation as a diagnostic tool as well as imaging. And we're on our way there, but I won't be able to tell you about that today. Maybe after I get my year of research sleep, I can tell you those stories. Okay, so MRI and batteries. If you've ever had an MRI, they immediately tell you to take all the metal out of your pockets. I've already told you we put the metal right in the magnet. <laughs> this is a problem. So we do an awful lot of work to try and still get good signal to noise in spite of doing that. Proton in, in tissue. So when you take an MRI, a medical MRI, you're simply imaging the protons and different their aqueous or lipid local environment. They can also use some relaxation tricks to get more detail out. But proton is beautiful, of course. Lithium is about two fifths of the sensitivity of proton. So we take a hit there already. And then we're going to add in a whole bunch of metal components. So here's a list of all our challenges. Here's Kevin and Amanda setting up an experiment and a big sign that says, please do not move. Because once we get this going, please do not touch. <laughs> um, so the main issue is those metallic components that create an RF shielding effect when we apply our radio frequency pulses. There's also eddy currents and magnetic susceptibility artifacts every time we change from one type of material to another. So if you've taken your NMR training, you know there shouldn't even be any particles in your solution. It should be perfectly clear. Well, we don't, <laughs> we don't do well on that score. <laughs> um, if we wanna get high resolution, like is typical in medical imaging, we have to overcome all of these boundaries. Sensitivity is limited because of difference in magnetogyric ratio. And then also we want to be careful that when we're quantifying things, we acknowledge that different species have different relaxation properties. So if we quantify and we haven't allowed all the species to relax fully, or we haven't accounted for that in the pulse sequence selection, then we're gonna get various results. So we always wanna acknowledge that up front and do all that we can to make reference samples and to do um, relaxation studies in parallel to make sure we're being quantitative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is one of the original in situ NMR experiments on a battery. Some of the tricks that were used at the time to get around these limitations were that they have mesh electrodes rather than solid electrodes as the current collectors. That's a bit of a sacrifice, but it worked. And then they seal the entire thing within a pouch cell. I was on sabbatical in Cambridge. We were using a laminator in the glove box with liquid inside this little pouch to try and seal the entire device and then fit it within a, this is about an eight millimeter coil. This is a solenoid coil, so it's a different coil geometry than what your typical saddle coil is in your solution probe, or what are, it's actually more similar to our MES, MES coils, although it's not at the magic angle. This was actually done quite a while ago. So 2007, this spectroscopy was done on graphite with a lithium counter electrode. What you see here is lithium electrolyte at the start. And as we go through time of inserting lithium into graphite, we form first the dilute stages, so one lithium layer every four graphene sheets, and then the more concentrated stages where we're getting lithium in every layer between the graphite. These are assigned. We know lots of things about these phases, and this was done very slowly, so they're not testing current density at this point. What we wanted to do was improve on the sensitivity and reproducibility of these results and basically just try and contribute to what was a brand new field 15 years ago. This is the um, series of lithiated graphite stages that I mentioned. And an important phenomena is that every time we open up a new sheet, we come across a kinetic barrier because that, uh, and it shows up as a dip in the diffusion coefficient. So this is the diffusion coefficient of lithium ions going across the electrochemical insertion. And these are the different phases that are being formed. And the really, difficult process is exactly this desolvation and insertion into the lithium and then propping open a new layer each time. So we want to be able to differentiate between when this is happening properly and when we're generating bulk lithium at that interface. So to get away from those little pouch cells and the, um, the solenoid coin cell geometry, the solenoid coil geometry, we collaborate with the group at University of New Brunswick led by Bruce Balcom. And we looked at this configuration called a parallel plate resonator. In the MRI community, they'll actually build a new coil every time they have a new sample geometry to deal with because they want to optimize the match of the coil parameters 
to the object that they're trying to image. So they'll have a coil for your knee, they'll have a coil for breast imaging, they'll have a coil for your brain. And this coil happens to look like a prismatic lithium ion battery. So we said, let's try it. This is now a parallel plate resonator where I could put a parallel plate cell geometry within the plates and be able to reproducibly put that in and out. And I'll show you as we go along how that worked out. It should give us high sensitivity. It should give us a large homogeneous magnetic field and it should avoid the RF attenuation issues that you have with a coil geometry. Okay, so this was our first attempt. This is back to MacGyver days. So this was actually a flat glass capillary where we slid the copper sheets in between and we epoxied the whole thing like crazy to try and make sure it was airtight. And then we ran the NMR in a pseudo in situ way, which means we did a little bit of electrochemistry, we paused and did NMR. We did a little bit of electrochemistry, we paused and did NMR across the whole profile. And what you can see is for two different charging rates, the light blue is the slow charging and the dark blue is the fast charging here, we form first the dilute phase of lithium, then the concentrated phase. And only in the case of fast charging, you see these gray bars showing up. That's where we were able to detect lithium metal plating. This cell geometry is kind of awful to deal with. And so we wanted to get a better configuration going. And we also wanted to be able to quantify this across the whole curve, not with this in and out kind of under the magnet every few hours in order to do this experiment. So here's the cartridge cell um, parallel plate resonator. This is the simulated B1 field done by Andreas at uh, UB. And this is what it looks like in reality. So this is a one centimeter scale bar. You can see this is now a large chunk of lithium ion battery compared to a coin cell. That's about four or five coin cells in terms of surface area. And it just makes it a lot easier to work with commercial type um, electrode materials. So within that, parallel plate resonator, we're now going to insert our cartridge cells. And these are optimized to fit in there. They seal with an O-ring rather than with epoxy. And yeah, uh, that's better. <laughs> and then they just slide in between the parallel plates. So this is called a MIC 2.5. It's an imaging probe. And we've designed this parallel plate resonator to fit in there. This is polymer electrolyte. So a polymer with some lithium salt. And we've in a few holes in order to give ourselves a phantom to measure. And this is a shift image. So we do a 2D imaging experiment to measure where we detect lithium. And you can see we can find all of the little edges and configurations of our little sheet of polymer electrolyte film reasonably well. Unfortunately, I will admit this is a painfully slow experiment. This took about 24 hours. So we're not continuing with this one. We're working on other pulse sequences that will let us be a bit faster. But we can do the spectroscopy perfectly well in this cell geometry. So this is our current collectors, our electrodes. These are co provided by collaborators. So we're working with commercial materials here. And we assemble the entire thing in the glove box. And then we do spectroscopy of a spectrum along like every 15 minutes. This is a slow profile, but we're seeing all the same things, the dilute lithium stages, the concentrated graphite stages, and these actually are the satellites because lithium is spin three halves. If you want to know more about that, ask me later. Okay, so we want to look at this in more detail. The next step we did was to create these contour maps rather than just the stack plot. And this shows you at a C over 10 rate, again, focusing on the dilute and concentrated stages of the lithiation. We can see the, the phase transitions very clearly, but it actually is one step better if we take the derivative of that stack of spectra. And the derivative shows you where the changes are happening. So now we can see very clearly, here's phase one, here's phase two and two prime actually as two different species, whereas they're blurred together in this maximum here. And then here's where we reverse the current density and we see them disappear in the same order. And this is at a very slow rate, so close to equilibrium, Everything is behaving really nicely. And the processing is done in a software package that's open source that was written by colleagues at Ohio State. Now we're gonna charge fast. So this is at one C, charge in one hour. And what you immediately see is this big eyesore of plated lithium, okay? So that's where lithium metal shows up. I should point out for you is um, when it's in a metallic state, we observe it as a night shift peak which is because of the un, uh, 
free flowing electrons in a metallic system. It's a little bit particle size dependent, um, but the night shift is very well known to be 256 ppm. And it's actually also orientation dependent. So we can differentiate between dendrites that are growing orthogonal to the surface of the electrode from plated lithium that's flat on the surface of the electrode. And those have different risk factors if you want to think about them from a battery point of view. Okay. But now can we get it to go away again? <laughs> We would not like lithium to stay there in a plated form. That would be a loss of inventory and irreversible capacity and a problem for your cell. So again, the derivative helps us to look at that. You can see that it builds up and then it disappears and it actually starts to disappear right during the OCV where we're holding the voltage constant. And the reason is that we think that this traffic jam of lithium that's in, at that interface between the electrolyte and the graphite surfaces during the constant voltage hold, it can now intercalate properly and find where it should be in the structure. And that's good news. But then if we look further on discharge, a certain amount got absorbed, that's great. But then a certain amount just stays behind. And this points out for you, you need both data sets. You can't just go straight to the derivative or you would think that all was well and good here. But in fact, there is an accumulation of lithium that's persisting, that's no longer involved in your electrochemical process. Okay, so 1C, we're already bad news. As a consumer, do you know what the target charge rate is? How fast do you wanna be able to charge your car? 4C, 15 minutes is sort of the holy grail. Claims they can do 300 kilometers charge in 15 minutes on their superchargers. I do not own a Tesla. I make no claim to know anything about that, <laughs> um, but that is the goal. That is what every auto manufacturer is looking for because that makes it map onto your experience driving a regular vehicle. So if we're already plating this, this much lithium at 1C, 4C is gonna be worse. And this is the kind of thing we're starting to study. But perhaps an intermittent charging strategy would be good. Dose, pause, dose, pause. These are the kinds of electrochemical profiles that we're considering. Okay, so now let's do five cycles. Same idea. Plating, 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 and accumulating green, getting darker to blue, got darker to dark blue here. So this is an exacerbating problem, a perpetuating problem. Um, and again, the combination of the derivative that help us to tell that story. So here's where I wanna give a shout out to summer students. I've had lots of good summer students in the group. Uh, I hired a summer student from math and physics and asked them to work on writing a code that would save us from having to integrate by hand. So if you remember back to the data set I from Sergey, we had 10 data points and we integrated by hand this much lithium and we wrote our bar graph. Well, now I've got data every 15 minute, 24 hour experiment, and my students are not gonna be happy if we have to integrate that by hand. Luckily, NMR people like open source code. So there's a program called Snake written by some really bright NMR people in the Netherlands. And it was open source. And so Alex could jump in there and take a look at what was there and create a routine for us where we can give the starting integration of all of those peaks and then press go and see how well it fits over a series of spectra. At 50, yeah, <laughs> Amanda's nodding at me, at least 50 spectra, it'll run a routine to give us the fits. And then it will spit out data as an Excel spreadsheet where we can go back to here was our contour map, this has lots of really great intuitive qualitative data, but it does not have a quantitative number for me, how much lithium is really in which phase. And now green is my total amount, the anode through charge and discharge. Orange is the concentrated phase, so that highly lithiated version of graphite. There's two gold, those are two different versions of the dilute phases. And then there's an electrolyte peak as well. Oh, sorry. I've missed one of them. The electrolyte peak is not in this data set. So this is a really important step forward and we're looking forward to being able to use this more. Uh, here's a data set from Amanda, hot off the press where we're moving from graphite to looking at silicone as an anode material. This is an important and valuable alternative to graphite because it has a better volumetric capacity. And most of us don't want our whole trunk space taken up by our batteries. 
Um, so what you're seeing here is now a, a case where we definitely see the lithium plating and we can quantify it and then see its persistence over multiple hours, even with the OCV hold in the middle. So that's where we're at right now. I hope I've given you a feeling for how valuable NMR can be for evaluating these kinds of systems. In conclusion, probe with the parallel plate resonator is really valuable. It gives us great sensitivity and the ability to sort of run a bunch of cells in series. We can make multiple cells and queue them up for their NMR time. So of course, NMR time is the most valuable thing in our group. <laughs> um, and the experiments at a high charge rate are really showing us important details about that lithium plating process that aren't available from the future, we're always working on noise reduction in capacitors into the feeds so that we can try and minimize some of the electrical noise that comes from putting wires into our NMR probe. Um, and then also we want to move to other frequencies. So of course, lithium is super valuable, but proton would be a great handle to look at you know, species in the electrolyte or fluorine. There, and unfortunately, just <laughs> we have to build a new coil every time that we um, want to change our um, multi-tune RF coil if you're used to solution NMR. But those are the kinds of things we're working on now. This is our group at the end of the hike with the dean for a tiny amount of ice cream. <laughs> um, these are the students that are in the group at the moment. We had a great time over the summer doing various pieces of these projects. At UNB, Denny Carly, Bordeaux, Dole. Who's been really very forthcoming with lots of ideas and data, and it's been very valuable over the years. And also the NMR facility. Bob and Hillary are just rock solid supporters of all the NMR activities. Most of you guys work with them on regular NMR, and they let us mess around with weird NMR, and they don't um, they don't get too worried. It's great. <laughs> um, and I just thought I would say here's where we're hoping to be over the next several months. Thank you very much for your attention. Giuseppe. I actually don't have access to that, so I should uh, I should talk sure. to you about that. I'm sure, you can do some experiment at uh, Yeah, probably, probably. probably. So, 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 somebody who one of the people running it for several years was a was young Clary. Okay, excellent. I'm sure you're right, and I just don't know who it is. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. Yep. Excellent. I will do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's right. I was thinking, I guess, that the resolution of the real time We might be able to. Um, we have. Uh, it's probably more about the signal to noise. So we still signal average for a fair number of scans and we're pulsing pretty fast. These are relaxing reasonably fast, but it's a good suggestion. We should, we should look at it. One, yes, yes, probably is. Uh, we do have the x ray data, so we will be able to look at that by x ray. By NMR, we haven't done any more with it than that. Yeah, but yeah, and we should do x ray and neutron. <laughs> yes, good, Alex.
That might be, that might be of interest. I can tell you the sort of macroscopic things people are doing is getting away from organic liquid electrolytes. So polymer electrolytes and full up solid state electrolytes are big focus. Um, there's a sulfide family, argyrodites and various ones that are quite competitive, but not air stable. So we seem to always create problems for ourselves by choosing air instable <laughs> materials. Um, so the, the probably broader, picture answer is that they, they want to get away from flammable organics. Yeah. Yep. The, no, I, if I said diagnostic, so we integrate the off-diagonal peaks as a function of the mixing time. But actually we get away from XE immediately because it's much slower experiment or longer experiment than the one-dimensional version. Yeah. Um, it's sort of cheating, but I would say it's locally amorphous. So you're getting a whole lot of local lithium environments because the phase is changing and they're not, and then it settles into a new phase and the lithium ions. Or there's too many possible environments. So they're all superimposed on each other. That's, that's the challenge. Um, I'll take a look at the refill data and uh, let you know if that turns out to be a true, but the x-ray is longer, longer range. So maybe that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it had stayed there, we would never would have done any more NMR with this system <laughs> if it had stayed very broad because you can't do a lot when, when it's become disordered like that. Yeah. Tony. <laughs> Because they spend a lot more money on the battery management system of a car than of a laptop. <laughs> yeah, I. I don't think there's anything particular. I think it really is that because it's such a more valuable component, they do a better job of managing its performance. So they don't let it ever get, I mean, how many of us have left our laptop somewhere where it gets super hot in the back of a car? That's a really bad thing for a laptop and there's no mitigation strategy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're just, they're just much cheaper devices. So I think the, the sort of engineering, electrical engineering controls are less. Right, you've shown us you can watch in real time as things fail. Yeah, does that give you an opportunity to watch in real time triggers that would facilitate the uncreating of the stuff? Now, Maybe because, because if it and I guess the real upside the question if it's played it out, it's over. Is that really where we're at now? Or is no, I don't think so. What they're trying to un yeah. What we're hoping is that we can unplate. So I didn't, but if you look here, the electrochemical treatment is charge at one seat, one hour really fast, constant voltage hold during which something is happening. And it seems to be the something that is reversing this lithium plating. So that's where this idea of an intermediate fast charge pause would possibly track it. Right? The signal that you. Look at that, so I keep sort of walking around with the charge. You actually 
Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know, but I do know people are working on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think so. We have not. What I'm thinking of is the, the example of lithium iron phosphate. So lithium iron phosphate has this beautiful flat voltage plateau. So it's a wonderful sort of performer and it doesn't have lots of degradation processes. The challenge is you've only got a flat voltage plateau. You don't have any gauge of how charged your cell is because you're only reading the, the output voltage. So people were talking about using the magnetic moment of the iron, how much iron two plus versus three plus as a gauge. I never saw that go anywhere, but that's the only example I can, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Problem. <laughs> You're welcome.